Welcome to the ResearchWorks podcast, live from the European Academy of Childhood Disability Conference 2024 in Bruges, Belgium. Join us for interviews with keynote speakers, world-renowned researchers and clinicians, and behind-the-scenes stories from one of the great paediatric conferences in the world. Well, we have another great episode on your way right now. We're talking to two of my friends who I've only really ever spoken to uh, online, but now we're in person. So hello, Ginny Pallig. Good morning. Good morning. Afternoon. afternoon. I'm not really not sure at the moment. And Rosalind Livingstone, hello. Hello. <laughs> Lovely to be able to speak to both of you. Now, you've both just come off from a Actually, you've had a few se- sessions today already. So, yes, you've already done two, Ginny, and you've just come off another one as well. Look, today we're going to talk about uh, a paper that you have just published, but it sort of comes off the top of a, a topic that you've already sort of presented on today as well. So your paper that you've published is all on supported stepping devices, something that I'm very passionate about. But you were also just in a mini symposium about positioning for GMS level four and five. So there's always so much to unpack there. It's a population in the group that we know that is heavily understudied. And when it comes to publications, publications in this area, the two of you guys are really responsible for a huge bulk of it. So how about you give us a bit of a summary about this latest article that you've published? And let's, let's take it from there because there's a lot to unpack here. Well, in the US, Ginny, uh, therapists were telling Ginny that they needed to order a stander first, and uh-huh. then they had to wait between one and five years before they could get a stepping device. When we know that in order to give children with non-ambulance CP more equitable opportunities for practice and for motor development, that they need both in the first year. Mm-hmm. So we published two scoping reviews on the evidence, first for standing and then for stepping devices. And in this latest article, we compared and contrasted the evidence through two contemporary frameworks, the F words for childhood development and the IHAT, that's the Interdependence Human Activity Assistive Technology Model that was developed from the HAT model by Fannie Lee. And we tried to illustrate the many interactions between the child, the family, the caregivers, peers and contextual factors when they're using these devices Mm -hmm. because children with non-ambulance CP are interdependent with others. And our aim is often to increase engagement and autonomy rather than expecting them to be completely independent. Mm -hmm. When we're prescribing standing or stepping devices, you don't just consider the child's needs, but the transfers, what they're going to be doing, where they're going to be doing it, who they're going to be interacting or participating with. And the emphasis is on being and doing together. I love that. And I love how well that aligns with the conference uh, theme, you know, the societal symphony. We're talking about collaboration, impact generation. So, you know, you've really touched on a lot of things there. I want to go right back to the beginning when you mentioned about standing frames, supported stepping devices, and often the dilemma it is in prescribing one or the other, it seems. Ginny, you've got a bit to say on that one. What, what? I have a bit to say on everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I think what's really fun about my 20-year relationship and with writing and researching with Roz is that I come to it with all these emotions. Like, I can't get a stander and a stepping device for my kid. I've got to fight this. And I try everything and nothing works. And then I'm like, okay, Roz, we're going to write. And then we write it and we submit it. And they're like, but there's not enough evidence. And we don't publish opinion pieces. You have to give us a scientific piece. And yeah. then... COVID happened and that was lucky for us because it gave us the time to get all that evidence behind it yeah. um, to be more understanding of what research existed and what the outcomes were. And then I'm again, the emotional one, Roz is the OT. So she's all about the facts. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so what she did, especially in the visual abstract, is that what it's called? Graphical abstract, Graphical abstract. is we sorted, yeah. what do you get from standing? Uh-huh. What do you get from stepping? Yeah. And so if you had to make a choice, which of these ICF or F word outcomes are more important to you? Well, if society is forcing you to change, to choose, choose yeah. then choose the one that goes best with the outcome you're looking for. Sure. Sure. I really like that. And I have seen that graphic as well. And I really encourage everyone to have a look at this article. We'll put a link of this one in uh, on our website too. It's open access, great graphic. I love that you've talked about both. Sometimes it's like one or the other. It's often like the conversation piece, often because it's of the expense. And that's usually the reason the barrier that's been presented but let's go through that a little bit more now. Like, why would you choose a stander? What's the evidence for that? And what's the evidence for supported stepping? Like, where does it currently stand? And I would agree, during COVID, I did see a lot of articles that you guys have published. There was a lot. Um, but now we have something to base our conversation on. <laughs> so what's the current evidence, Roz? 
So the um, the experimental evidence is stronger around in standing when it relates to bone mineral density mm-hmm. improvement, prevention of contractures, and less strong, but but there's there's emerging evidence um, for impact on hip stability. Right. And so it's kind of more the the fitness or the body structure and function kind of outcomes. They're okay. a little bit stronger. Um, when it comes to supported stepping, I mean, there is uh, evidence for improvement in bowel function, and um, but it's more about activity and participation, and there's tons of qualitative research about how it, it improves like children's sense of autonomy and independence mm. and their relationship with others and the whole impact of being eye to eye. And um, when you look at what why therapists are prescribing ste- stepping devices, it's not so much about walking or the gait pattern or the stepping. Yeah. It's about increasing physical activity. Yeah. And so I think the potential is there that we could show changes in muscle development yeah. and and um, these other like fitness out cardiovascular outcomes like if you think about it logically those are the things that yes. might improve in a stepping device yes um, or as in a standing frame it's more about the alignment in the weight bearing you get better you get better weight bearing obviously mm-hmm. when you're uh, in that more supported position but mm-hmm. I think the key thing is that you, you can do them all, that there are benefits from both. If you can't get funding for both, maybe you can put on the knee immobilizers um, to get better standing and weight bearing when you're in your stepping device sure. for a period. And then yeah. you move for other things. So if you're yeah. standing to do art or something, maybe you put the knee immobilizers yeah. on. But then you take those off and you move with mm. the other kids to mm. other activities and so on. I love how it's always about the options and it's not just about one or the other. And I think that's where... I don't know, I feel like we've spoken about that as well. The tyranny of um, the tyranny of or, or, the power and, or of and yeah, and Jeannie it, Minkle, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's really quite an interesting fact. And and how did our uh, how do we go down that path when it doesn't align with anything that we would ever accept in our lives? <laughs> you know, it's it's a really interesting thought. So I have three kind of kayaks. I have one for two people, <laughs> one for rivers, one for rapids, <laughs> one for lakes. You know, I have it all. I have my mm-hmm. right, my road bike, my off-road bike, my racing bike, my power bike. Like, they deserve that too. That's right. And sometimes people will argue you can't do it all. And what's been really fun is now we've got three articles on you can have it all. We've got mm-hmm. a case study with a kid with spinal muscular atrophy type 1 treated. Mm-hmm. We've got twins with pretty significant... Uh, dyskinesia. And now we have the um, Hutch study as well. I'll let Roz go into the details. Yeah. Yeah. So as part of the um, early power study, when we were loaning uh, devices, power mobility devices for six months, we also, um, we were trying to figure out a way to track whether their use of the device changed at the beginning and the end of the loan. Was it just novel? And then they spent lots of time in it. And um, and did that go down over time? So as part of that, we collected, we used the Hutch questionnaire, which asks about all the devices that mm-hmm. they used. So, so we had data showing how much time they spent in their stander, if they had one, how much time they spent in their stepping device and seating and so on. Yeah. Um, and then we looked at it and we thought, well, it'd be really interesting to see um, did they did their use of the stepping device or the standing frame go down when they were using this novel device that had been given to them? And yeah. actually not. Wow. Um, for the GMF CS4s, uh, I think there was one only one child who decreased their time stepping and increased their time in power mobility. For everybody else, it was either the same or 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 less you know more time in stepping or they were stepping more so i think that was really it's just a descriptive study but it's really exciting to show in a group of young children that at any gmfcs level and that was three four or five Mm. that that using the power wheelchair did not decrease the amount of time they spent stepping I want it all and I want it now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all about living, giving children the opportunity to live their very best life. And uh, I feel like what I've been talking to a lot of people at the moment is instead of seeing all the barriers, we're trying to find solutions because goodness me, there's there are so many barriers. And if we just kept making assumptions for people going, oh, look, you, you can't do this if you do that, that's based on our perception of where we currently stand, rather the person in front of us, what allows them to live their very best life. Mm-hmm. What I find really interesting about uh, the, the, your articles that 
you presented the F words and the I hat. And I would really, I want to make sure we have time to talk about that because that's really unique. I love how you've mapped everything out to the F words. People are quite familiar with that. And the I hat, the I for interdependence. Can we talk about that for a little bit? Because that's, I find that very interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, that was really kind of an eye owner. I mean, it was Ginny, we, the, the way we'd gone with this article is we had tried to get it published a number of times. First, it's an opinion piece. Then they told us to make it into a review. Then we're like, well, we've already done a standing review. So <laughs> let's do a stepping review. Let's put it together. We got turned down again. And we're like, OK, let's do a more <laughs> theoretical take on it. And Ginny sent me um the the abstract of the I had from and the rest of Sean Williams. Yes, yes, yeah. yep. And um, the interdependence focus just really made me think about our kids at GMFCS four and five. What came out in the literature was really the influence of the environment, how important the influence of other people around them, the caregiver, <laughs> um, the the parents, the peers, the other children, like when you think about prescribing assistive technology, it's not just thinking about what matches the child's yes, needs. It's yes. about thinking who's going to be putting them in that device. Are they able to lift? Are they going to need a piece of equipment? Where are they going to be doing it? Is it in the school environment? Mm. Is it the home environment? Mm. Is it inside? Is it outside? What activities are they going to be doing? If they're going to be interacting with other children, well, then it's maybe not so good that they're a great height off the ground that makes it easier for the adults, but the other kids can't yeah. actually be face-to-face -face with yeah. them or they can't get into the water table or the sandbox. So you have to think about all those things. So this model just helps you to really map that out for each child, really, to really map. think it through. Yeah, and think about like what are the features of yeah. the like what are the factors of the child, their abilities and their interests and their goals and the activities that they want to do and how that relates to everyone around them and then the environment, you know, those uh -huh. the family and the friends and the caregivers. I mean, that's really important when you think about, you know, it's quite often reported the high rate of abandonment of assistive tech. No matter what kind of tech you prescribe, usually any bit of tech is like, ooh, fancy, shiny, I would like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we talk about limited resources, well, this is our responsibility to assess this as well, right? To make mm -hmm. sure we gain the right piece of equipment for the right time, for the right circumstances. And I think the model, Elizabeth Nielsen said this today in our first session together, that the child doesn't need a power chair. The system needs a power chair. And yeah. that's how it's supposed to work in the States. We have IDEA. So when you're in early intervention, I'm supposed to loan you all these things so you decide what fits for your family before you wow. access to health insurance. And in IDEA in Part B, when you're in school, it's the same thing. If you just need a power chair to get around school, school's supposed to provide that if it's part of FAPE and if it's a goal on the IEP. So... I think what I, the change I really want to see is, and in, in Andrina Sabet and Heather Feldner and Lisa Kenyon, this on-time mobility, this, yeah. this, this is a human right. It's already in the law. It's already in the philosophy. Every state in the United States is supposed to have a state assistive technology center. Well, every single one needs these pieces so I can go get it. Yeah. So I don't yeah. even need to make new things. I just need to enforce what's already on the books. Wow. That's really powerful. And I guess from here, now that you've published this and you're here talking to a lot of people as well, where would you like to see this, this paper that you've written uh, really have an impact on it? What would you like to see now with the F words, with the, with the I hat? What do you want clinicians to do from here? I need you to build me a support walker, like a real stepping device that's dynamic, that goes up and down, side to side, moves. Uh -huh. So not too much mobility, not too much stability, but it's from PVC piping so that mm -hmm. I can make it for $5 anywhere in the world out of mm -hmm. cardboard, pipe cleaners. You tell me what's out there, yeah. uh, my engineer friends, and you tell me how to make these things so I can get it to everybody. I believe everyone deserves the best and everybody should get yep. the wheelchair they need, you know, yep. with the most incredible technology. But if that's not a reality, then I still need another way to get it there. It still needs to be a way. Yeah. It's, it's not just accepting that that's not there. It's actually mm -hmm. trying to find a solution again. Um, right. Yeah. And, and loan programs, I think, are, are key, right? Yeah, yeah, we saw this great guy. He just took like an, a metal walker from the trash, like an adult walker, uh -huh. and then put like this, I don't know, what was it? Some sort of plate that lowered like the TLSO kind of thing into uh -huh. the plate. Uh -huh. And the kid was off and going. Wow. Right. And and, and in their, um, the this, this scoping review of stepping devices, we came off that study from India where they, they basically took a K walker and then they just attached supports to it and made, turned it into a hands free walker so it can be done yeah. in more resource settings and yeah. people just need to be yeah more in creative. Kenya they made it out of yeah. cardboard in carb yes wow. yes yeah. so we yeah. did try to in in 
incorporate some of those ideas because mm. yes it's not all just about the the high resource setting and That's the right. big expensive devices yeah. but it's about giving kids opportunities in the best way that you can yeah and I think what you're showing here I mean it was really encouraging for me is in this population fours and fives it commonly is a lot of handling it commonly is a lot of uh just positioning. I'm not saying position isn't important. It is important, but it's always just about that for a static position right. that they hold on for. And I don't know, we've all traveled here to brew. So we've had to sit on a train, we've had to be on a plane and it is uncomfortable to sit in one position. Yes, That gives us a glimpse. But if we can find a way, just a way for these kids to be a bit more active, then we're going a long way and just trying to meet their needs. Yeah. Um, Mark Peterson yeah. is saying the sedentary behavior is killing our yes. adults yeah. and Shuin is telling us we need two hours of day of activity and if standing counts because the metabolic rate goes up mm -hmm. yeah. and it counts as exercise well then a stepping device a bike ballet swim yeah like we should be able to get to two hours yeah that's yep. right and Regardless we guys gms yes and we've shown like in the hutch study it was really that's what came out is is roughly about an hour a day in the standard and about an hour a day in the stepping device and yeah. then they were also doing time in in the permobility device as yeah. well and if you think about the GMFCS fives, I think, were the ones that showed um, the most time in those devices. Yeah. And I think that's because parents probably realize that otherwise those kids are mostly lying on the ground yeah. or they're in their supported seating system strapped mm. in, not able mm. to not able to move. Mm. And so those devices can actually give the parents different opportunities and ways to put them that they can be more active yeah. and exploring and engaged. That's right. That's right. And, and we, we've touched on it a little bit, was that it's not just about taking steps. It's not about walking. It's about all the other psychosocial benefits from physical activity. You mentioned that earlier. Physical mm -hmm. activity, well, why do we engage in it? Mm -hmm. For all those great reasons, right? We get uh, that that hit of the positive feelings, the self-esteem, resilience, confidence, like we all enjoy those things too. So mm -hmm. um, lots for us to think about and a wonderful paper to really put everyone on the same way, wavelength when it comes to this population as well. And if you're interested, I did make a walker out of PVC. I even put up on, on YouTube and designed it and mm -hmm. glued it all in and it was pretty good. So now I need to add a little bit of body support and they can be hands-free. <laughs> It's a good option. But yeah. thank you so much for your time today. I really loved chatting. I'm sure we're going to chat much more during the conference, but um, I hope for everyone else that was really useful for you guys as well. We'll talk to you all again really soon. Bye. Bye.